This is Geneva, renowned for its private banks, for its expensive watches, and for its luxury hotels. And today I'm visiting one of these hotels, the Four Seasons Hotel de Berg, where we're going to talk with the director about what makes this hotel competitive. Mr. Silva, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, you are the general manager of the Four Seasons Hotel de Berg here in Geneva. You've been with Four Seasons for 20 years or more and obviously have a long experience of the luxury hotel industry. First of all, would you say that you're a successful business? The Four Seasons Hotel in Geneva? Yes. Uh, definitely. Okay. We, we tend to measure ourselves on a ref bar basis, uh, which is revenue per available room, um, in nineteen in two thousand and eight and two thousand and nine, we performed uh, ref bar penetration against the next best four competitors of one hundred and seventy five percent. So our premium on their revenue per room is seventy five percent more, whether we were in the way up or in the way down. And what kind of occupancy rate do you typically run here? Uh, the occupancy of Geneva is normally, the, the stabilized Geneva is a, at the five-star luxury is 60%. When the economy is doing quite well, we move to about uh, 65. Uh, and uh, I would say we've performed 77%, 78% on, let's say, the market behaving at a 65%. So we, we normally have a premium on the rate of uh, 20 to 25%, and a premium on, uh, sorry, premium on the occupancy of 20 to 25% and a premium on rate of about 50%. And how do, you, um, how do you do that when you have, you're a relatively small hotel, aren't you? You're, no, you're not the biggest five-star hotel in Geneva. You're I would say we're uh, at the luxury level. We're about an average size. Let's say uh, us, so the, the Hotel des Berg, Four Seasons, the Richemont, and uh, the Beau Rivage are all uh, approximately at 100 rooms. We would have a smaller one at 50 rooms, which is the Hotel d'Angleterre and a larger one, which is a Mandarin Oriental, at uh, 200 rooms. The Hotel de Berg recently celebrated its 175th birthday, is that right? Correct, correct. Uh, making it the oldest luxury hotel in Geneva, and possibly in Switzerland, is that? That's, that's correct. Uh, just to give you a comparison of other flagship hotels, uh, let's say the Ritz Paris, known by Cesar Ritz as probably the father to the, the way we do uh, business today in our industry, the Ritz was built in 1870, and we were built in 1834, so almost 50 years, two generations uh, before. What has Four Seasons brought to Hotel de Berg? We, we fully um, reposition your investment, so we, we look at, a, at the building the way it was, and first we elaborate a plan to reposition it physically, so the, the construction, the renovation, so we deal with the physical aspect. Then we deal with the um, people side of the business, the service side of the business, and that's what we're the most known for. Um, we reposition now, we built a team uh, that will help delivering the service of the brand, what the brand is known for. Uh, and then we launch a marketing campaign to let the world know that the hotel has been repositioned, renovated, and now under the Four Seasons management and then we write to all our client base and uh, try to influence, uh, obviously, uh, the revenue side of the business. We are now in one of our junior suites. Okay. Um, our interior designer, Monsieur Pierre-Yves Rochon, who is a very uh, uh, famous interior designer in Paris, has done a lot of our, uh, a lot of our hotels all around the world as well as in the Middle East. Um, he has really decided to give our hotel a very residential feel and his um, choice of colors are always in the very pastel, subtle colors. Currently we are in one of our uh, green scheme colored rooms mm -hmm. and this one um, we always have about 90% of the hotel that is uh, uh, along these colors. We also okay. have the same rooms in blue scheme as well. Our aim, uh, Four Seasons aim, is to operate one of the two best hotels on each city that we are present. Uh, obviously, uh, we say that the five best hotels all have a good location and what will make the difference between their location and good product, because you need to have physical product as well, 
uh, we believe that this, uh, the people element, the service side, will actually bring you to the first positioning. We, uh, we actually say to our, in our business plans, we say that uh, our objective is to run one of the two first hotels, or for obviously we fight for the first place. Uh, our conviction is that uh, it, it is our people that are bring us, that will bring us to that uh, positioning. And how do you put that into practice? So what are some practical, can you give some examples of what you do? To, because it's easy to say, obviously, that our people are our greatest asset, and many companies do this, well, and yet company. they don't put it, every company pretends this and doesn't put it into practice. So As I say to, you, to the press when I meet them, every leader will tell you their people are their most valuable capital, they're their best asset. They're, it is what makes the difference. But if you aligned 10 leaders and you ask them questions such as, how much time do you invest? Uh, which you're in your people, you personally as the leader, not your organization or yourself. How much time would you invest? How much money would you put in it? How many resources? What are the different types of resources? And the questions, the answers then will become very different. So what we aim at, we aim at spending more time in our human resources than any one of our competitors. Uh, in fact, at a further provocation, I would even say that Sometimes I like to think of Four Seasons as a human resources company rather than an hotel company. Because everybody else can do the croissants, the coffee, the check-in, the check-out. Everything we do, generally speaking, our great competitors know it. So what will differentiate us is the people. If that is the case, if it is the service and the people, then you, the know-how that will make you the leader is a lot more about the human resources know-how. So it starts by uh, myself personally interviewing everyone that will join the hotel. And now that could be the director of marketing, or it could be a maid, a cleaner, a dishwasher. I will personally interview everyone and make sure that they have the right attitude. It, for us, it starts with an attitude. Um, we're not as focused as some of our competitors on the technical skills of, our, of the employees that join us. So we spend a lot of time understanding what motivates people and what gets them to go the extra mile for, for our clients. Um, and uh, we believe that, as everybody else, it, that it isn't the money. Obviously, the money equation needs to be dealt with. And uh, we have put a positioning worldwide where we say, we pay, our salary is based on the average of the best three payers of the city. And there's no other discussion about compensation in our company. However, we have as being a better partner for your career a better partner for your personal development, uh, a, a better environment for you to work for. So our understanding on what motivates people starts with having a sense of pride on what's achieved on a daily basis in their department. Having a sense that they personally have contributed to the success of that department. So there's a sense of I agree with the way we do business and thanks to me, I feel that our department is a little better. So they start to build their own self-esteem and a reward of working for, for the department. A sense of growing. Beyond that, everyone, uh, most of our workforce is, I would say, between 25 to 35. So at that age, very, very important that you have a sense that today you've learned something and next year you'll be doing something different. So you, you want to have a sense of personal growth, personal development. Um, and eventually a, a sense of it is a nice environment to work for. So, and uh, when, you, when you have a workforce of, we average between 200 and let's say 400 employees in, in, in most of our hotels, to create relationships between human beings that are positive at all moments of the day, that uh, the relationships between their colleagues, their superiors, their employees, all work in a positive way, uh, creating an environment that everyone will give the best of themselves. It's a bit more complex than just saying our people are our best asset. Uh, you need to work at it on, on a daily basis. So does it always work? Or? It doesn't always work, but we hope it works more than in our competitors. So to give you some examples, I meet with line employees. What we call line employees is the waiter, the cleaner. Uh, I meet with them uh, every month. Uh, it's a meeting where their department heads are not invited. They can send one representative to their choice of their department. So all departments nominate one person. And we talk about the business, we talk about their problems, we talk about their recommendations. It's usually focused on 
ideas to improve the quality of life for them and the workplace, ideas to improve uh, the service to our clients and uh, ideas to um, improve the profitability of the company. Is this your way of staying close to it's, the business? Or to it is a way to stay close to the employees uh, because they're the closest one to the, to the clients. And if you want to stay close to your clients, you need to stay close to your employees. A lot of people do, a lot of companies will do a lot of studies on their clients, but I'm not sure they do as much on, their empl on the employee side. So we stay extremely close to, to the employees. Uh, I, uh, I have breakfast a couple times a year with the night shift employees that clean, that never see management. We're trying to give them ownership of, the, of their departments, ownership of the hotel. We like employees that when they come to work, they feel this is my hotel, this is my department. And that's probably for us the most successful way to have them go beyond the call of duty. This is our um, employee restaurant, it's called Quai 33 mm -hmm. and um, we always have on a daily basis a selection of different salads, People, our employees can make their own salads, we're usually very health uh, conscious as well, we always have a vegetarian option, today is a, is a vegetarian uh, quiche and then a selection of, of vegetables and, uh, and obviously uh, potatoes and some meat or, or fish. So the menu changes every day. Uh, always a selection of cheeses and desserts and yogurts. So it's really very health oriented. And, and how does this, is this something that uh, is complementary to employees or do they pay for this? Or this is complimentary for all the employees. It's really within the Four Seasons culture to include uh, the meals for, for all the employees. In Geneva and in Switzerland, I believe we were the very first ones to include complimentary right, meals right, for, absolutely. For, our, for our employees, which makes a big difference. And, and, and this is something again about how you treat your employees and, and that your employees making them understand that they are valued by the organization. Absolutely. An extremely important part of our culture is the way that the, the employees feel valued within the company and this is a small gesture but but it makes a difference when sure. uh, we always have two or three times a week live cooking for, for the uh, for the for the staff so we always have a chef there cooking uh, lively for for the staff and that makes a difference as well so the quality of the food is always important um, when we talk about service in our company achieving an excellent service is only the phase one for us, let's say you, you ask your meal in the restaurant, it's properly served as you required on time, the waiter was polite, everything was fine. We say thank you, this is great, but that's phase one and if we only do that, I'm not going to say it's a failure, but it's a missed opportunity to go beyond the call of duty. We teach our employees uh, that first thing, you, obviously you have to get it right, you have to deliver to the client or the customer what they're asking in, in an efficient way, polite and friendly, with a certain friendliness. But then you also need to, to personalize that service. So we would like to think of exceptional service as going beyond the call of duty and coming with a special recommendation for you during that, uh, that meal or remembering a wine that you have had two weeks ago and we noticed you liked that specific Bordeaux wine and we can give you an idea on the next lot vineyard that is also great, that is less known, that you'd like to discover. To personalize service for yourself, that you're not just another client to us. Exceptional service at a five-star level is everything you deliver that hasn't been asked for. But it's challenging. So you have to create a workforce that has enough confidence that they can make decisions without anyone uh, giving them a reproach that, oh, why have you offered that for free? Or why have you done that? Uh, three weeks ago, one of our uh, room attendants found that one of our uh, guests was traveling, uh, lady guest was traveling with a picture of their children. That says, I miss my children. Right? The, the employee picked up on it and went and bought or recommended to someone to go buy a frame. Obviously, we bought a traveling frame. It was a leather flexible traveling frame. And as the guest came back to the room, she saw the picture of the children next to the bedside table framed. So that says, we care about you, and we went beyond the call of duty. We have noticed you. You're not just a client. So uh, we have ongoing training sessions where we, we teach those kind of attitudes, and we share the, the initiatives. The lady that done that was nominated, obviously, employee of the month. Her idea was the next day circulating on a best practice within the hotel. 
How do you avoid that level of service becoming automatic? We have service standards like, like our best competitors. Beyond that, we tell them you have to customize the standards. And that means it will be your decision, the decision of our employees to apply the standard or not to apply it or to adjust it to that specific guest. Uh, let's say we have a standard that we're supposed to introduce to you uh, the services of the hotel. Well, if you're checking in at 6 in the morning, the last thing you want is an employee to introduce the services of, uh, of the hotel to you. So we say to the employees, you have to personalize this, the standards. Uh, we want to be efficient, we want to achieve a certain performance, but yet you have to personalize it and you have the authority to apply it or not. So that breaks the standardizing, or we don't give them I'm going to say fixed sentences. We say you have to convey a uh, welcome, uh, you will choose the, the right way for each specific uh, client. So I, I think by we give them autonomy uh, over it. And then we say, and you have to go above the requests. Uh, so we, we celebrate all the individual initiatives of personalized service. And we, we hope that, that that inspires all the workforce to do the same. But it's um, it's an everyday task. I mean, can you say a little bit about the customer then? What, mm -hmm. what type of customer is it you attract? The most demanding ones. Um, sometimes I say that people come to us because we've been identified as the best hotel in town. Once you've you succeeded to position yourself at a premium, whether that's thirty percent above red bar or eighty percent above red bar, you you become a, a, a clear leader recognized by the clients. But if they are corporate leaders, they're probably also <coughs> looking at their own costs and, and uh, the cost of their business. So why do they choose to come to you and pay perhaps a premium um, for what is after all perhaps you know, a better service, uh, a little bit extra care, but on the other hand they could save a lot of money for their company if they stay in a, in a slightly oh. cheaper five-star hotel. Why, why do they come to you? We try not to have a premium more on the rate more than 10%. So if you want a basic room, you'd be paying on about only about 10%. What we have is more sweet customers, it's like if our airplane had half of business class. So how do we, the question is why do we attract the business class more than our, our competitors? Uh, obviously they've recognized the service, but once you're traveling business, you've established that for you on an overnight flight, it's important to travel business. Uh, last week you mentioned when you arrived that thank God we didn't have the snowstorm. Geneva was paralyzed. One of our clients said, hey, I'm sorry, I can't get a taxi, everything is paralyzed. What can you do? One of our employees took his car and drove him to his meeting. He was laughing. And I'm sure he's telling the story to the world. Uh, we're a bit like an insurance policy on your traveling. We don't promise that everything will go right. But uh, if they don't, we believe we have a better chance of securing your traveling than uh, maybe uh, our competitors. Your, your customer changes over time, I imagine, and, and their needs and wants <coughs> change over time. Uh, do you do anything in particular to stay abreast of that change, to actually recognize All the, the change? Time. Um, we started the interview about talking about competitiveness, and we've spent a few minutes speaking about uh, the, the human element. Uh, but you need to be competitive on everything. I mean, your product. Uh, product changes, habits change, ways of life are changing every year in a much, much faster way. Uh, we try to create a workforce that is very, very uh, innovative and creative. Uh, what will keep you ahead of the, uh, of the curve is the innovation and the creativity of your company. If you don't have a culture of change and innovation, it's impossible for you to reach the leadership position. Our hotel is, uh, I would say, more classic than contemporary than modern. One of our main competitors, um, Richemont, Rocoforte, which is a lot more contemporary than Four Seasons, uh, was going to open uh, our number one competitor in a contemporary style. He was very concerned that his product would appeal to a client base that we wouldn't. Immediately, we start building a suite for, uh, for that clientele, and it's been quite successful. Uh, we are right now relaunching a <coughs> renovation on the sixth and seventh floor and immediately we've designed a product that was going to be weekend friendly. Excellent. So this is uh, one of your newest rooms? Is that right? Absolutely. This is uh, the mock-up room for uh, all of our uh, renovated rooms for the current phase of renovation that we are doing at the hotel. We are currently um, redoing 40 of our bedrooms, so completely refurbished them 
um, and so we are introducing this style of decoration which is perhaps a little bit more um, contemporary still maintaining the Four Seasons classical um, style. Um, and is this a, a regular room or is this a, a this suite is, already? This is or already a, a, a junior, junior suite, suite okay. because once again it has the, the, the couch area which, okay. uh, which uh, gives a, a little bit more, more space and, and comfort to the guests. What's interesting as well is that all of these rooms have their own um, private uh, fireplace as well. So all the rooms on the, on the sixth floor and the, the ones that are renovated have their fireplace. They have the, the central bathtub with the... Uh, with the um, um, bathroom with the two entrances, you also have the private hammam in every single in every single room. So it gives you that space of uh, um, a sense of luxury here. The biggest strength in the leadership of Four Seasons is that we we we, we empower management, uh, we empower the employees, and we seek for initiatives uh, in everyone. So we don't tend to have ways of doing things. Yes, there's a standard of quality uh, that is consistent, but I believe that the way, the way we achieve it has been different. We've been in constant change since we were born 45 years ago. I joined 20 years ago, and everything we've done was different. And, uh, and maybe it came from the leadership of our founder, Mr. Isidore Sharp, who was not an hotelier was an architect building hotels, trying to understand the business and trying to stay ahead of the game because he felt everybody else knew the business except him. And that's how he was born and it became just a way of life and he hired people that were a bit like him and uh, the motto of change in our company uh, was created at, from the very early stage. Uh, so rather than, than taking things for granted, actually it was a leadership that was willing to experiment and to learn along the way and to adapt itself and test change drive. and test drive. We test drive it doesn't work all do the time. And we have a culture that it's great to make a mistake. And a lot of people will say that, but it's not true. Because they, they mean it. No one lies. Everyone means what they say. But at the end of the day, their employees don't truly feel that they can say, oh, your room will be complimentary, sir without someone saying, why did you do it? Um, and, and here we practice that if an employee has to go to his manager to ask permission, it's already a failure. So there we have it. The Four Seasons Hotel de Berg or how to create a sustainable competitive advantage through your people.